the topic that I've had two or three different things that I was told that I talk about this evening. So if I seem to be freelancing a little bit, I'm trying to weave some things that I thought I'd be talking about, not from you all, I've just gotten uh, different things from different people. So I'll weave a few things in, and I want to leave a considerable amount of time so that we can have discussion. We have a good uh, group, <clears throat> intimate enough in size for us to have a discussion rather than my just standing here talking to you this evening. Uh, I want to emphasize that first and foremost, for a number of you, you may not be aware, but if you looked at the poster, you would be aware that this month is designated as Black History Month. It's a month that has been designated as Black History Month across the nation since 1976. And that designation came off college campuses in 1976. But the actual impetus for this observance started in 1926 by a man by the name of Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Dr. Woodson was actually the second African-American graduate of Harvard University. And he was a, an historian by profession and training. And he was very frustrated with the fact that he knew certain facts about contributions that Muslims had made, uh, that African-Americans had made uh, for the betterment of this nation. But he was very frustrated that in all of his research and all of the guides in which he had to teach students that there was nothing that he could find that was positive about the role that African people in the United States had played. And this was, of course, in 1926. Now, in 1926, just to try to set a backdrop, we're talking about, in 1926, we're talking about maybe, I'm not good in math, so I may be a little off in my arithmetic here. But we're talking perhaps less than 60 years after the abolition of chattel slavery. As a matter of fact, maybe 61 years uh, from the abolition of chattel slavery in this country. And if you know anything about that institution, you know that part of its uh, uh, justification, uh, if in fact you could ever justify something like the degradation that human beings were put through in this institution. But part of the justification of chattel slavery in this country was the fact that the people who were being enslaved, the Africans that were brought to this country, were people who had no culture, they had no real language, they could not read and write, they were very limited in their intellect, they had no religion, they had no civilization, there was no culture to actually speak of, that these were people who were living in the jungle, and that these jungle people were actually enlightened through their experience and through their interaction with those who had come to forcibly kidnap them and bring them into the Western Hemisphere. So part of this narrative about who these people were was the fact that they have, they have nothing to contribute to the people in this part of the world other than their labor. If they, we don't use them to just forcibly uh, labor to help build this great nation of America, they have no use for us. They've done nothing useful whatsoever. And so this kind of racism had even seeped into the religion, the primary religion that's practiced here in the United States, which is Christianity. And it had seeped to the point that even the Christians, the ministers, the Christian scholars, were saying that these African people didn't have a soul. They were soulless people. They were justifying the enslavement of people by saying that they are the cursed descendants of one of the children of the prophet Noah, the prophet Noah, and his name was Ham. And because they were descendants of these cursed people that a prophet of God had cursed this man and cursed his descendants, then slavery of these people is justified. 
as the Bible. You can read the story in the Bible. And it was corrupted, a corrupted story about the prophet Noah. And the Bible that actually reads that after the flood, that the prophet Noah got drunk. And he laid out drunk with no clothes on in a tent. And his son Ham came upon him and saw him, and he laughed at it. He thought this was pretty funny. Like, this is your dad? Like, if you see your dad in some kind of crazy situation, you may want to laugh at him. You, you know, not degrade him, but, you know, it might be funny. So Ham thought that, according to this Bible uh, uh, story, that Ham thought that it was funny. And so he laughed at his father. And the story goes on to say that Noah, the prophet Noah, cursed him and said, you and your descendants are going to be slaves. That you're going to have woolly hair and all of these kinds of things. This is the story. This was the Christian narrative about the African people in this country from both the academic, the physiological, the intellectual, and every aspect Black people in this country and their descendants were looked at as subhuman people. During the time that when Dr. Woodson put together what he called Negro History Week, it was a time also when not only were the accomplishments of African American people completely ignored, but it was also a time when the, it was the most one of the most difficult periods after, his, after slavery in the history of black people in this country because it was a period of lynching, of just lynchings, of white folks going into communities. And if they feel that in some kind of way an African American had insulted the dignity of any, any other slight, any other slight or, or moving from the etiquette that had been established in this racist society at that time, they would just grab the offending person and just take them to a tree and hang them, or break into the police station, break into the county jails, take the person out and just hang them from a tree and burn them. It was a very difficult period, extremely difficult period for these former, these descendants of formerly enslaved people. So out of that context, out of that historical context, here comes a man who is African American. He's educated at Harvard University. And right there, he's going against the conventional wisdom. People were saying that black folks couldn't learn anything. They couldn't think like that. They couldn't process. And now he's going back in history. And he's looking at the history of African nations. He's looking at the accomplishments of black people after being here in the United States. So Negro History Week, and it went through the time, and it evolved, as I said, in 1976 into Black History Month. And now, technically, we have African American History Month, but it's still commonly referred to as Black History Month. That's a context for this discussion that we're having here today. Because just as Carter G. Woodson, when he looked into the history of America, he couldn't find the recorded history of black people in any significant degree. And when I and so many others looked into the history of Islam in the United States, there was a similar kind of omission that when you look at the history of the United States for the most part, you read that the history actually began in 1875 when waves of immigrants from Lebanon, from Afghanistan, from Syria, and from other primarily Middle Eastern countries started to come into the United States, mostly settling in the Midwest, a little bit, uh, I guess that would be a little bit east of Colorado, in the Detroit, Chicago, uh, Dearborn area. 
And then the history tells us then other waves of immigrants came into the country and established masajid, established schools, established Muslim organizations. Until now, today, we have perhaps 3,000 known masjids or musallas all across this country. That we have a population of Muslims today that go from any estimate from five or six million up to eight to nine million Muslims in the country today. But I want to just spend just a little time to inject that role of African people, what role, if any, what presence, if any, was there and has there been of people of African descent who contributed to the history that we now look at and call the history of Muslims in this country? Brothers and sisters, when we talk about the history of Muslims in America, a first wave of Muslims coming into this area that's now called the United States has to be looked at as those African, enslaved Africans who were brought to this country in the bowels of slave ships, starting in the early uh, in the early, uh, in the late 1400s and into the 1500s, always up until the 1700s, I guess the 1800s. I told you I wouldn't go with numbers. I just mess up every time I try to quote something that has numbers involved with it. So I'm talking about the late 1400s, then 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, even into 1800s, although officially the importation of enslaved Africans into the United States was supposed to have stopped in 1807, but of course we know that it carried on for many, many more years and even decades. So what happened when these Africans were brought to the shores of the United States? We know that so many coming primarily from West Africa at the beginning and at the end of this centuries-long hideous institution were coming from West Africa. If we know anything about the history of West Africa in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, West Africa was the home of Muslim empires. You can read about these empires, the empire of Mali. You can Google it. Don't Google it right now. I want you to pay attention right now. But you can Google these empires in West Africa. You can look at their history and you see these were Muslim, predominantly Muslim empires. That Islam was the predominant influence and the predominant religion at the time of this transatlantic slave trade. And so it only makes sense that when this slave trade started and you're going into West Africa and the people are Muslim, <coughs> that a large percentage of the people that would be brought to this country as enslaved persons would be Muslim. Now those who were brought from West Africa on these slave ships and who were kicked off the boat in South America. And primarily the history tells us that those who were kicked off first were those who were the most rebellious <clears throat> the most rebellious on the slave ships. Those who were kicked out next, they say, well, they were next to the most rebellious. And those who, like my descendants, who came to the United States, they say, well, they were fighting too, but they were not as rebellious as the people in South America, Central America, the islands, and uh, as the people here, more than the people here in the United States. The history of Islam the history of slavery in South America is very clear that the concentration of Muslims enslaved Africans in South America was much greater. The number who were Muslim was much greater in South America, much greater in Central America, much greater in the Caribbean than those who came to the United States. Which 
lends me to believe, just a logical deduction, that that high concentration of Muslims who were on these slave ships, that those who were responsible for this human cargo wanted to get them off those, these slave ships as quickly as possible. And so a higher number were thrown off, taken off, and sold in south of the United States, in south of North America. Now, when those remaining got to the United States, one, and this is the statistic that is known today, and I truly believe that as further research is done, as more individuals find interest in this, it pushes this research further. But today, one out, we know that one out of every third African who was brought to the United States in the transatlantic slave trade, that one out of every three was a Muslim. This is a very significant finding in the history of Muslims in the United States. Because as an African American, when I embraced this land, there was no talk of having any Muslims anywhere in this country at that particular time. No Muslims. No, there were no Muslims amongst these Africans. That they were all just animists and all of these other kinds of things. But one today, the research shows that one out of every third African born to this country was a Muslim. And these Muslims had a significant impact on the history and on the development. First and foremost, their presence alone went against the narrative and the justification for enslavement of these people to begin with. Because the enslavers and the church community is saying that these are pagans. They worship trees. They don't know, they don't have a God. That they worship any and everything. That they are illiterate. That they can't read or write. But the presence of these Muslims, because many of these Muslims were actually scholars of Islam. They were imams of Muslim communities. They were princes. They were princesses. They were some of the creme de la creme, the top of Muslim society, had been forced into this enslavement in this country. And not only were they forced into the country, but now they said that they don't even have a religion. They're savages. They're heathens. So do whatever with them that you want. That this was one of the roots of this, the, 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 uh, the theology of racism. That the basis for it was they're soulless people, they just have no civilization or anything else. But the truth was very far from this supplication, this, this supposition. It was very far from that. Let me just, just give you just a few quick examples of some of the Muslims that we know about their story. We know about them so much that once you hear their names, and you won't do it right now, of course, because you're paying attention to me for a few minutes. But once you hear their names, it's become so rooted in the research that you can just Google their names. It's like they're hidden in full sight. But because the narrative is so different from the reality, we don't even know to look them up. If we want to know the history of Islam in the 1700s and the 1800s and all of this, we don't know their names. Because history has just given such a different reality, a different narrative about Islam and how it came into the American landscape. Let me just share just a few of these folks with you. I want to talk a little bit more uh, about some other history of Islam in this country. And I want to end on a note that tries to tie what I'm about to talk about into a kind of, to tie it all together. Because I honestly feel that to just listen to someone talk and talk about history 
whether we're talking about the history of the Prophet Muhammad whether we're talking about the history of Islam under this, the, at any point, whether we're talking about the history of any people, that unless and until we take that history, we take that knowledge and try to do something with it, then it's, it's just entertainment. You may as well go look at the movie, like people are going crazy over this movie, Black Panther. Right? I think it was released today. Uh, I had lunch with my, uh, 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 a dinner with my daughter and uh, one of my grandchildren uh, before leaving North Carolina. And my granddaughter said, you know, Poppy, 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 uh, you're going to take us to go see uh, Black Panther. And I said, really? You know, and then my, my daughter, you know, her mother, my child, sitting there, and she said, said, yeah, you know, Abu, let's, uh, you know, when can you go with us to go see this movie, Black Panther? And I, I said, well, let me pay a little more attention to this, because this is not the norm for my granddaughter or for my daughter to, you know, want me to just take them to the movies and see something. So I started looking up some, some things about it, and I was reading that this has almost become a cultural phenomenon among a, a lot of people. I mean, people are really into this. And people will be more into this, I, I guess it's Marvel Comics, this comic book character, even though it's a black cast to it, people will be more interested in that in a fantasy kind of world than in the reality of actual history that has taken place in any kind of future projection. So I feel, let's not just be entertained. I'm not here to entertain. I want to inspire us to move from where we are, where we may be right now, to another point. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna go through this quickly. As I said, I want to, uh, to spend more time engaging in discussion rather than just, just talking at you the way that I'm doing right now. Let's look at some of these enslaved African people who everybody was saying, no soul, and all of this other kind of thing. One that we know the name of, and, and I've done a little research. I wasn't able to find uh, anyone uh, that would fit the description of some of the folks that I'm talking about in Colorado, because Colorado was sort of off the path when it came to population centers, and especially something like slavery during the period that I'm talking about. But I'll talk about some other folks who were enslaved in the South, and the, the, the enslaved in the mid-Atlantic, and some even in New York. I, there was a man, a Muslim, by the name of Muhammad Ali Ibn Said. Muhammad Ali ibn Said had the misfortune of being a slave, an enslaved person, enslaved African, or a servant on five different continents. And how did this come about? His enslaver was a person who was a merchant that traveled the waters. And so he would go from country to country and continent to continent and sometimes, at a certain point, he actually sold Muhammad Ali ibn Said to others who were doing similar kinds of things. He figured he could get more money by selling him than he would by a shipment of goods, so at one point he actually sold him. Muhammad Ali ibn Said ends up coming to the United States. And the person he had been serving before coming to the United States was impressed with his loyalty and how good he had been and, and uh, how much he had benefited his, 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 uh, his business. So he said, well, when you get to the United States, I'll take you to an area where you don't have to be a slave. And so Muhammad Ali ibn Said, and we see some of his name being referred to in the history in an anglicized kind of way as Nicholas Said. And so, but Muhammad Ali ibn Said goes to Detroit, Michigan. And while he was in Detroit, Michigan, he was a school teacher. He had a passion for teaching folks. He spoke six, seven, eight, perhaps eight different languages. He was a very brilliant guy. 
And so a, a big little conflict started developing called the United States Civil War. And Muhammad Ali Ibn Said, in a relatively comfortable position in Detroit, Michigan, decided that those are my brethren who are being enslaved in the South. And now we have white men who are going to fight to try to free them with these Union troops. And so Muhammad Ali Ibn Said heard about and read about an experiment that was happening in Boston, Massachusetts, where former slaves and freedmen, people who were never slaves, but who were, uh, were of African descent, that they were being enlisted into an, all, what was called an all-colored regiment. It was the 54th all-colored regiment of uh, Massachusetts. Some of you may have heard about it. I mean, it's a dated movie, but maybe it's still on Netflix and some of these other kind of uh, access, ways you can access movies. You can look at it on next Netflix. You may have heard of a movie called Glory. It was starring, nobody seen it? Nobody heard of it? Yeah, you my man, you the man. <laughs> okay, you can look at this movie called Glory. Star, stars, you may have not heard of this guy. It's an actor called Denzel Washington. Anybody ever heard of Denzel Washington? Yeah. Okay, I'm good. I thought I was coming to North Carolina or something. Nobody ever heard of No, no. Okay. But Denzel Washington started in this movie called Glory. And it's a factual, accurate representation for all colored regiment in out of Boston, Massachusetts. And in that regiment, there were Muslims in that regiment. And when you look at the movie, you'll see in certain scenes the uh, brothers of this 54th Regiment. One brother in particular had a real big, beautiful beard, uh, big beard, sitting around. He was the only person that they showed in the movie with that kind of beard, a good, nice, pretty Muslim beard. And but so Muhammad Ali Ibn Sayyid could get to Boston in time, even though he went through Canada and came down back down to get to Massachusetts. He couldn't get there in time before they'd already been dispatched to South Carolina. But he got there in time to be a part of the 55th All-Colored Regiment out of Massachusetts. That regiment, like the 54th, was sent into South Carolina, which was just a really, really hotbed of slavery and racism, and it was really, really terrible there. And they went to South Carolina. Now, his history after that kind of uh, disappears. Uh, folks don't know whether he was killed, that we don't know what happened to him, but we know that this was a very highly educated African who had been enslaved, that had made a choice after he was free, that he couldn't remain free and good conscience when he knew that so many of his brothers and sisters were still enslaved. It's something that was resonating him, with him and within him of what the Prophet Muhammad had instructed us about. Any of us sitting around watching any kind of boom, any kind of oppression, no matter what it is, or being knowledgeable of any form of oppression against an individual or against a people. The Prophet Muhammad has said that how we respond, and I'm paraphrasing a hadith, how we respond becomes a testament to our iman, our very faith, that if you see it, you hear it, you know about it, and you can stop it with your hands, you stop it. If you can't stop it with your hands, you speak out about it, you write about it. If you can't do that, you have to at least hate it in your heart and not be a part of it beyond that, you have no faith. So if I'm sitting around in 21st century United States, knowing that there are targeted populations in this country that, for example, like for mass incarceration. Mass incarceration as one of the worst, best examples that we can give. Something that the American citizenry 
just like during the time of slavery, have been convinced that the reason why there's so many African Americans in prison is because we are criminally inclined. This is something about our genes that make us have this propensity to do criminal acts. The same thing in a different format that was given as a justification even for slavery. There's something wrong with these people. They can't function in a normal environment. So we have to lock them up. But to guarantee that we lock them up, what we have to do is to make sure that their degree of arrest is so out of proportion with their numbers, their percentage of the population, that even if a few slip through the net, they're still going to have disproportionate incarceration rates. That what we do, we will target communities to dump certain drugs into these communities. And if you read and you believe books, like the book that was written by Gary Webb, who was a journalist in Los Angeles, California, if you believe and if you believe subsequent information that has come out about the CIA's involvement in drug transportation into this country, and drug distribution in this country, you will know from this book, Dark Alliance, that the CIA was responsible for not only bringing cocaine and crack into the United States, but outlined a distribution network, a pattern a, of targeted communities from the West Coast to the East Coast where these drugs would be distributed like crack cocaine. That if you want a high percentage, as what happens in places like Chicago for mass incarceration, like what happens in cities like Chicago, where before I'm able to get back home, I go to uh, Chicago and Charlotte, where brothers, young men, African-American men say that they get up in the morning, they've gotten up in the morning and go out their front doors in their houses and their crates of high-powered weapons, crates of them, crates of ammunition that were not there the night before, but when they come out their doors in the morning, it's like a child at Christmas running downstairs and the Christmas tree is there with all of the gifts up under it. And so these weapons of mass destruction are targeted and distributed in minority Latino and African American communities all across this nation. All across this nation. So by a systematic process and I'm not saying that there's no personal responsibility. I'm not saying that. I'm not offering that one bit. But I'm just saying that there is government and other infrastructures uh, complicity in helping to make this mass incarceration system the way that it is and the disproportionate number of people of a non-white descent who are in these prisons and this country locks up more of its citizens than any country in the world. Any country in the world. There's no country that locks up 2.6 million of its citizens anywhere on earth other than the United States of America. And so while we sit here, while we may ourselves not be immediately impacted. We may not have a brother. We may not have a father, an uncle, a grandfather who's caught up in this mass incarceration system. But many other millions upon millions do. They have their relatives. They have their loved ones who've been targeted and have been successfully entered into this. It's the responsibility 
of those of us who are Muslim to know about what's going on around us and to not be indifferent to these situations of doom, of oppression. We have to speak out against it. So the presence of these African Muslims, many of them, as I said, were scholars. It just totally shattered the narrative about who these enslaved people were. Let me give you another example. This is a person coming from the South. It's a person by the name of Bilahi Muhammad. Bilahi Muhammad. This brother was a slave, was an enslaved African on the on Sepolo Islands. This is an island off the coast of the state of Georgia. And Bilahi Muhammad was on a plantation where the plantation owner had an image or vision of, of a, an idea about how this institution was to be carried out. And he didn't believe in breaking up families and selling off families and brutally beating those who were under his, his uh, over, uh, uh, he was overseeing. And so what this man did was to allow the Muslims on the plantation that he owned to have Salat al Juma. He allowed the sisters to wear hijab, just like these sisters are wearing hijab. He allowed them to have halakas, to sit down and study Quran, to study the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad. He allowed them to have marriages that everyone had to respect unlike what was going on in almost all of the plantations across the South. This was a very unique situation and a very similar situation on another one of these islands called uh, St. Simeon that was also off the coast of Georgia where, where another first, uh, uh, brother by the name of Sali Belahi was the imam on this. But let me just tell you quickly a little bit about Balahi. This brother was recognized and is recognized as the first known Islamic scholar, documented Islamic scholar in the United States. The first known documented Islamic scholar in the United States was an enslaved African from West Africa, more precisely in the Senegal, Gambia area of West Africa, who was enslaved on the Sepulo Islands off the coast of the state of Georgia. And so how does he get this distinction? And so many others, I'm saying, well, they were scholars and they were imams and all these others. He wrote a 13-page in Arabic document a 13-page document in Arabic. As a matter of fact, he was the imam of the, the, the Jamaat there on the island. Uh, he was the recognized sheikh on the island, but he was still in the condition of being enslaved. But when this document that he wrote was finally translated, I'm not sure of the exact year. It was, it was in the 1930s. It was housed and is now housed in the University of Georgia uh, a library. And when this, this document, these pages were translated, it was recognized and realized that what he was, had written was not a journal about his, his experiences. It wasn't a diary, but it was a 13-page Arabic document written in Arabic of Hanafi Thick, that he was giving fatwas about certain things and giving the Hanafi Thick the lil as the evidence and the reason why he had made certain decisions among the Muslims that he was responsible for. So it's the, he was the first known scholar. It was not somebody that came 
in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 80s, 2000s. No, it was an enslaved African on the Cephalo Island. There's so many others that we can talk about. There's so many cases of Muslims who are, we know their story, we know about them being uh, scholars and so many other things. We know about so many others who came here with the religion of Islam, with Allah as their Lord, but were beaten, but were tortured, but with many were maimed, may have a hand or foot cut off for trying to hold on to their faith of Islam. Uh, anybody here familiar with either the, the story or the, uh, I mean, the TV minis miniseries or now uh, you, know, you can see the whole thing of the book called Roots? Uh, good. And you own it, man. I got to get your email address, man. You're on top of things here. Roots is a, a, a book. It originally started as a book. It was written by an African-American author by the name of in his family, from the old people in his family, that there was this old African that everybody said that he was our ancestor, that he was the first known in our family that we can point to and say that he was the first one in this country. And so he started on a 12-year quest to track that story down, to connect those missing links. And he connected the final dot in the Gambian city, a village of Jufere, in Jufere, Gambia. And he found that his ancestor, that all the old people in his family had been talking about, was an African by the name of Kunta Kente. And when he found out the story about Kunta Kente, he realized that Kunta Kente was, as a, was a Muslim. That Kunta Kente came and was kidnapped from an African Gambian village, which was 100% Muslim at that particular time. And you go to Jufere, Gambia today, and it's still a 100% Muslim village. And so Kunta Kente's story was one of the first popular uh, that entered into the mainstream of American literature. It was not a research project. It was not, his story was not to be found on microfish and all of these other kinds of almost ancient tools that were used back in the day. But it was in mainstream America. ABC television turned it into an eight or nine part miniseries. We were glued to the television watching the story unfold, a fascinating story. But it was the story about a Muslim who had been enslaved in America who refused to give up his Islam. And so the history of the early history of Islam in this country is a history of those whose names we know, those names we don't know, that so many of them actually became celebrities in their, their, their areas. They became celebrities across the nation. And one like Ayube ibn Suleiman, Job ibn Salam, who was enslaved in Maryland for two years and ended up going back uh, to his home in modern day uh, uh, Senegambia, that he was also literate in Arabic and wrote uh, what was known to be the first Muslim uh, uh, journal or, or diary or journal or chronicle written by an enslaved African. This was also written by a Muslim. So these are very important, uh, even if you're not a Muslim, is a, they're important uh, milestones in American history. But when we know about these things, and we know about these individuals, they become important personalities and individuals in the history and the development of Islam in this country. And uh, I want to say a couple more things. I'll stop. I want to open it up to questions and comments. 
But why is any of this history important if you are not of African descent? Why do I even need to know about this? I'm Muslim and you're talking about all these Muslim folks and you know, a ton of others can talk about, can talk about so many other people. But why is this even important? It's important because it's the history. It's the Muslim history of this country. Anything that happens in the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad in every Muslim nation, the history, what's going on today with the Muslims of Burma, the Rohingyas, who have been stripped of their citizenship, that a genocide has been unfolding on them for the last few years, is one of the most quiet public genocides that this country has seen in this, this uh, not just this century, but the last century as well. It's nothing short of a genocide of people who are indigenous to the land, citizenship taken, forced out of the country, women being violated in just camps designed just to violate the Muslim sisters, thrown out of the country, property taken, at one point sent out to sea by the tens of thousands to left, be left out there to die. Those are our Muslim brothers and sisters. What's happening to them should pain each and every one of us. Why? Not because I'm saying it, but because the Prophet Muhammad has made it clear that this Ummah is like a single body. When one part aches or catches a fever, the whole body aches. The whole body is sick. I can't go around with my back aching and not throw off my whole system. I can't do it. I can't pinpoint and isolate and compartmentalize suffering in one part of my body and not have my whole body and disposition affected by it. This is how the Prophet Muhammad has said this Ummah is like. So you don't have to be from West Africa. You don't have to be from East or South or North Africa. You don't have to be from Southeast Asia. You don't have to be from uh, uh, Australia. You don't have to be from Mexico. You don't have to be from Guatemala. You don't have to be from Ecuador. You can be from anywhere. And if any Muslim or group of Muslims are suffering, or if any group of Muslims have accomplished something that they take pride in because it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that's part of my history. It's part of your history. We have to claim all of it because it's the history that is part of the single body of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad So it's not just learning about black history amongst Muslims when you learn about the things that I'm talking about and more. It's about learning about the history of Muslims and Islam in this country that I may or may not have known about before. When I reject any part of the success or the suffering of anyone or any people in this Ummah, then I'm acting other than how the Prophet Muhammad has said that I and you and all of us are to act. So, on this occasion of African American History Month, I want to issue a challenge to myself and to you. Because you know the month of February is the shortest month of the year. And when I first learned about Black History Month, I said, well, why is it in February? 28 days? I mean, come on, man. You got the shortest month of the year, and now you're talking about you want to celebrate black history in such a short period of time. But Carter G. Woodson, in starting Negro History Week, he said, the reason why I chose the month of February was because there were very 
a lot of very of important historical developments and birthdays of people who affected African people that were born in the month of February. So this is why I selected this month. Abraham Lincoln, born in the month of February. Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist, a diplomat, a former slave, uh, slave African, and other things that we can say about him. A tremendous orator, born in the month of February. There were so many people born in that month, but also so many people who did outstanding things to contribute to the betterment of African people in this country were born in that month. So that's what happened. So my challenge to myself and to all of you during this month, if in fact you can accept the premise that I've offered tonight, that this history is the history of all of us. Brother Ibrahim can't just claim that history and say that that's his history because he comes from an African people. He can't say that. I can't say that. It's the history of all of us. And the best way that in our individual capacities that we can celebrate this history is to learn more about it. And don't just live on the pages of history, no matter even if we're talking about the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad It's a history that I teach on a weekly basis in the masjid where I am. I love the Sirah. I love the Prophet. I love the Sirah of the Prophet Muhammad I love to teach classes on the Sirah. But one thing I tell the students in the class is you can't live on the pages of history. It's just information. If you don't take it off those pages and incorporate it into your life, you can't just live in the past. The past should just be a prologue. It is a prologue to the future. It's something that can be good, it's something that can be bad. Let's make the knowledge of the history of Muslims in this country, the Muslims of, of any country, what is good, what we can draw from, celebrate, learn that history. In this country, learn this history and do what you can from whatever vantage point that you are to try to make an improvement in those con the condition of those that I'm talking about in this area of mass incarceration and all of these areas. I'll close on this particular point. I was at an ICNA convention, uh, regional convention, in Houston, Texas, uh, maybe three years ago, possibly four years ago, I think it was three years ago. And I, uh, I, I can't remember what my assigned topic was, but as you see tonight, I'll just stand up here and talk about what I want to talk about, you know. So I forgot what the assigned topic, topic was, but I couldn't in good conscience speak and address an audience and not talk about a Muslim response, the Muslim responsibility to all of these killings con uh, that the police were doing against African American males. I mean, just shooting folks down like dogs. Right here in Colorado, he was sitting in his car, wasn't it Colorado? Um, was, um, it's been so many of them. Orlando Castile, was that Orlando, Colorado? Orlando Castile. Was that Colorado? I don't think so. It's not Colorado? Okay, all right. So I'll, I'll let you all off the hook. <laughs> We're not coming out against them. Okay, but there were so many, there, there have been so many and that continue to go on. So I was talking about these, these, these killings. And uh, I was approached after I, I went out, the, uh, out, I was about to go out of the auditorium, everybody was leaving, and his brother approached me. And he stopped me, he jumped in front of me, and wouldn't let me pass. And I said, well, brother, what's wrong? And I, I thought he was joking with me some kind of way. So I said, uh, you know, I, I met you angry or something, what's wrong? And he started railing on me and was talking about how dare you talk about these kafas at a Muslim conference. They must have been doing something wrong. He, all the ones you talked about, they had to be doing something wrong because it was the police that killed them. 
and the police are charged with serve and protect. And so I didn't want to shove him out of my way, but I said, brother, first, just give me a little space. You know, we can talk. You don't have to get up on me like that because where I grew up, somebody stepping up on you like that, they're ready to fight. And so I may have some kind of cultural difference and misread what you're doing, and I'll clock you upside your head, man. Just step back. You don't need to be that close up over like that. So I told him, I said, well, brother, it, it may be that wherever you live or whatever country you come from, that may be the case. But if you're talking about an institution that started as slave patrols and slave catchers, do the research. This is the origin of modern day police departments. They were employed by plantation owners to stop enslaved people from escaping, to track them down, to be patrols. This is how the institution started. Until this day, a lot of that same mentality seems to exist. And I said to the brother, look, you're of a certain ethnicity, certain national nationality. If this were happening to your son, because he had his 14-year-old son with him, if your 14-year-old son is gunned down under very questionable circumstances, your nephew is gunned down, your father is gunned down, your friend's father in Ohio is gunned down. I went through this thing. How would you feel then? And he said, well, that's not what's happening. I said, that's the very point. It is a targeted population, right? A targeted population. And so in the interest of what's right and what's just as Muslims, we have an obligation to stand out and be a standard bearer for justice. Allah tells us that. He commands us to do that. Stand out firmly for justice. Don't just say, I'm for justice. Be a standard bearer. And that involves sometimes putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions by saying things that may make people feel uncomfortable. OK, so I'm going to stop at this point uh, and ask if you have any questions or comments. I mean, the statute of limitations has run out, so you know, I'm not looking for you to turn me in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from, I'm not a U.S. citizen. You're not a U.S. citizen? No. Okay. Only, only, only thing, you look identical to uh, a brother who used to be a part of our community, uh, and he moved to, uh, moved to West Virginia. And uh, I don't know, do you remember Asha? Is it medical? Just like him, so I, had, I, I just thought it has to be his son, because I know he has a, a son about you. So I'm sorry, sorry about that. Sorry about that. He just looks so much like his brother. I had, I had to this. Just like I stopped what I was saying and asked the sister, uh, who was her father, because he looks so much like her father. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, questions, comments, and I promise I'm not going to ask you about your parents. <laughs> Questions, comments about anything. Yes, sir. Yeah, off of our discussion, and, 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 as a as a student group here at MSA, 
uh, what are the best actions that, that we can take either by awareness or by we we just we just like to keep the brain on brain on what you yeah. see students doing towards right. this problem. Right, right, right. I think one thing, if you haven't already done it, you should go to the site, uh, Burma Task Force, um, I'm not sure if it's Burma Task Force USA, but it's Burma Task Force. Uh, they have a tremendous resource, uh, resource pages as to things that you can do, and there's so many things on there that you can uh, uh, download and run off copies of, of materials. Of course, I think you know, we've been talking before, and I think you all, do you intend in participating in the rally in, in uh, D.C. at the end of the month? I think it's the 28th or something. Uh, no, I, I didn't mean that. Did you? No. It's something. Something. This definitely is not down the street. I mean, it's, it's going to D.C. is quite a distance from here. But um, in addition to that, and also I would recommend getting in contact with the folks with the Burma Task Force because it would be great to have uh, one of them come out here and uh, uh, as a speaker and, um, and as much as I try to, I mean, Brother Ibrahim can attest to this, for the last two and a half years, almost every single football, no matter what it's about, I mean, have to remind people of the Bohemians. I've been doing it every single week for about two and a half, almost three years. And uh, so it's something, it's, it's such a um, neglected, they're such a neglected people, uh, and nobody seems to care. I mean, the majority of folks just don't care. It's just a very dismissive attitude about what the people are going through, uh, what they have gone, gone through. Um, and the minimum that any of us can do is make dua on a consistent basis. Uh, that's the most powerful weapon that we have for the believers is dua. And uh, so we make dua that Allah, uh, through the trials, through the fitness that they're going through, that Allah uses that to bring them closer to his pleasure that they become better, even better Muslims than they are as a result of the trial, that it not be something that they get impatient and they, they, they move further you know, from along. And that Allah uh, touched the hearts of the leaders of these Muslim-majority countries. Because it's, it's shameful, it's disgraceful. Uh, the, uh, the public apathy I mean, people may care in the, in the privacy of their homes, but a lot of these Muslim majority countries won't open their mouths. I mean, Turkey is a very notable exception. And um, even telling Muslim countries that we'll pay for you to, to uh, relocate, allow folks to come into your country, and we'll pay for the relocation, we'll give money to your government if you just allow them to come in. They've been very, uh, the Turkish government has been very outspoken in this regard. And uh, to me, it's very significant what they're doing. And they are, uh, in Bangladesh, of course, uh, they are taking people in, but from those who've been on the ground over there, they say that the conditions are, are bad. It's, it's, it's not a good situation. So everyone can make dua. And I think rather than just making dua just one time and letting it go with that, that we need to every day ask Allah to, to ease the suffering of, of the people. Bring, use that suffering to bring them closer you know, to his pleasure. It's a, it's a horrific situation. And I can't say, um, you know, to be quite honest, if uh, I start talking about it too much, I'll probably start crying. I mean, seriously, it's, it's just that heart-wrenching to me um, to see these Muslim people um, 
go through what they've gone through for these past few years and see the Muslims who are in a position to help them if it's no more than relocate, uh, which they shouldn't have to do that. I mean, this is their home. They are actually indigenous to that land. They've been there longer than a lot of these other folks who are now you know, who stripped them of their, their uh, citizenship. So, so make the one and, and try to just be proactive. If there's something that can be organized on campus, uh, probably I would suggest doing some kind of educational program to just bring it more to the attention of the campus community, let folks know that this is really going on and it's this horrific and we have to do something about this. And so donate you know, time, labor, whatever it is, whatever you can to, to, to help bring attention to it and just make it do Silent, silent rituals or anything, whatever it is, I think you need to, you, you should and feel, you should feel obligated to do something. It can't be something that we can just know about and not do anything about. Questions, comments? what happens when you eat man? <laughs> ready to chew. This is more of a general question. Sure. Maybe not the meaning about us as an as an Oma. Uh, or you being actually. We we tend to on the personal side it, it's great to make your act and everything but uh, God ordered us aspect, which means like uh, you take with reason and with reason you take actions. Right. Uh, unfortunately, us as an Oma, a Muslim Oma, we really lack that action part. Yeah. Even even before the action, we lack good intentions. And right. <laughs> so how do you see, or what would you advise us as the like, young generations of Oma to, to, in order to move towards a better, Muslim by being more proactive, by being action takers. How 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 do we educate ourselves to be that way? How do we? Yeah. I can go a lot of like, yeah, off yeah. tangents for a lot, but I, I think yeah, that that's that's right. a that's a very good question. I think <clears throat> the primary thing that distinguishes us from any other activist is our relationship to a law and our dependence on a law for outcomes. Um, I was not always Muslim, and before I became Muslim, I was a college student. I became a Muslim in my senior year of college. And before that time, I was just so thankful that we didn't have mandatory classes, because I spent almost as much time in protests, because I was going to school in D.C. It was a very socially turbulent time, so everybody would come to D.C. to protest. And, you know, I was uh, a regular. Uh, protesting one thing or another, and um, I was able to get through my classwork, but I was not a regular participant for a lot of years in, in school. And I hung out with a lot with the activist crowd there. And when I became when I became Muslim, it was very clear to me that if I just wanted to chase issues. Islam was not the thing for me because I didn't have to be, become Muslim to be involved in certain social activist work. But if I truly believe in Allah, and if I truly wanted, based on my belief, to make a difference in any of these circumstances, I had to wed myself and just immerse myself in this belief in Allah and the belief that a law is totally controlled. We can't control outcomes. The law is in control of these outcomes. So even with the work that I do with the uh, Council for Social Justice with the Islamic Circle of North America, on any level, it's always first and foremost, a law is first on this. And, and I know what you're saying, and I agree with you that uh, after you make dua, after you make salah, it's meaningless if you don't get up to try to do something to affect change. But that should be the first step. 
making sure that our relationship with the law is, is as pure as it possibly can be. Otherwise, we're no different than the, the other, you know, menu list of, of activists that are you know, involved and engaged across the country. But uh, the, the young people, I'll say to all of you, don't waste your youth on doing nothing, inactivity. It's, it's, a, it's a shame for the youth not to be engaged and involved in social justice and social change uh, activities. It's, 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 it's a sin, it's a shame. Because even if you look at the movement of the Prophet Muhammad so so, you had a few old heads who were like 30 years old or 40 years old. But we're talking about a movement, particularly in Mecca and even into Medina, that was built on a, up to a large degree on the back of young people, just like you all. Right? I mean, people, teenagers, like an Abu Huraira, I mean, as a young kid, I mean, you can't pick up a volume of hadith and don't read all the narrations from Abu Huraira, but he was a young man, very young kid, 14, 13 years old when he started collecting these hadith and dedicated his life to this, only around the Prophet Sallallahu maybe three years. But he has all of this. Everybody can contribute something. Zayd bin Thabit wanted to fight at the Battle of Barter. He was too young. He was too small and frail. Prophet Sallallahu sent him away. He said, look, you know, go, you know. Uh, he had already learned Quran. His mother had him to show off in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Show him what you know. And he started reciting all these ayahs. And she, he said, said, okay, well, go learn the language of the Jews. Go learn their language. So he went away, and he was gifted with language. And so he learned it in a very short period of time. He came back. Now can I go fight? He said, no, that's good. Now go learn Farsi. So he went away, and he learned Farsi. He came back in a very short period of time. Can I go? No. no. And it was learned this dialect of this language. And then eventually, he was at the point where the prophets of Allah said, okay, now say you can you could go fight but in the interim you become one of my scribes you start writing down this revelation as i relate what's coming to me and so the history tells us and we talk about zayd and thabit not as some warrior even though he did fight in battles but as the scribe the primary scribe of the prophet muhammad so there's something don't waste our youth doing nothing. Because uh, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu made it clear, youth is one of the things you take advantage of before you get old. You get like me and Ibrahim, you become a little limited. You see, I'm praying out of a chair because of back surgery, fused discs, and all that kind of stuff. Right? I used to not have to do that. Right? So even in the most basic ibadah, I can't do it the way I want to do it. I can't make such the, the best position on earth I can be in unless I take the ground and stick it up on my head or take a rug and put it up my head while I'm sitting in the chair. So don't waste your youth when you have the energy, the vigor, and all of these things being inactive, acting like old people. Don't waste your youth being ultra conservative about this may happen. If I do this, this may happen. You know, this teacher, professor may not like me. If I take this particular stand, it's kind of, Allah is in control of all outcomes. So let's do what's pleasing to Allah and engage because Allah will, de will determine what's gonna happen. But let's not waste this time now, this period right now. This is the time before you get uh, major responsibilities and you have kids now who, you know, you haven't had to shell out money and trying to help them go to college and go to graduate school and these kinds of things and you have mortgages and have all of these other things. It becomes more limiting in practically what you can involve yourself in. So while you're young and you're not uh, laden with certain kinds of responsibilities, this is the age to you know, get your education and 
and ground yourself in whatever area of work that you, you, you study, but also this is your time, a prime time for activism. This is, this is prime time, prime age. Everybody in this room, this is the prime age to get involved because life happens and a lot of people get slowed down. But then there's some people who, uh, even though those responsibilities get greater and more children come and everything else, there are those who even say, well, uh, I'll do the best that I can. I'll be the best father, the best mother that I can. But this work for a law, and a law come first. And then you talk to their children. Like I had the opportunity of talking to one of a lot of Abu Ala Maldouni's sons. And I asked him, anybody know who Maldouni is? Go to check Google. Abu Ala Maldouni. <laughs> look up, go to check Google. You look up everything else, so go to check Google. And look at Abu Ala Maldudi. He was one of the, uh, he influenced Islamic thought and Islamic movement in particular. Uh, he's, he had one of the greatest influences of a Muslim thought and movement of the 20th century. Okay. And so, uh, I mean, a towering personality. And I had the opportunity to speak with one of his sons. He, uh, Maldudi died in 1979. And in about 1977, I think, I had the opportunity to talk with, his, with one of his sons. And I, because I had read a lot of his, his material that had been translated into English, and I asked him, tell me about your, your dad. Tell me about your father. Because he wrote all these books on all these different subjects. And I, you know, this, this is my man. And he said, well, you know, brother, from what I understand, you probably know more about my father than I do. I said, what are you talking about? You know, I'm down in the south of the United States. He's over there in Pakistan, writing in Urdu. Now, how am I going to know more about him than you, his son? And what he said was that my father was so committed to Islamic work and Islamic movement and the organization that he created he said that the images that I have of my dad growing up was either him sitting in his study, writing all the time, or he was in jail. And he was in jail not for like the dude, you know, snatching pocketbooks of women at two o'clock in the morning in the market. He was in jail because of his Islamic work, because the government of Pakistan was, you know, anti the kind of uh, Islamic movement that he was talking about. So he spent years in prison, on and off. And his son said the rest of the time he was either running around with the brothers or he's writing in a study writing. But his, his sacrifice is one that all of us, all of these decades afterwards, are able to benefit from. He's left behind a body of work, just like in this country. Even though he was only Muslim for 11 months, Malcolm X, Right, El Hajj Malik Al Shabazz. He's left behind a legacy in the 11 months that he was actually practicing the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and following the guidelines of the Quran. That he left behind in those 11, 11 months a legacy that meant so many of us all around the world, just like Malana Maldudi, can look at what he was saying and look at what he was doing and be inspired by these things as Muslims and try to emulate in whatever way we can just the pieces that we're qualified, that Allah has given us to be qualified in. So if a person is an IT person, right, use that IT knowledge to uh, speak out, find creative ways, uh, 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 be, uh, create software, that will be beneficial to this woman. You know, there's a, a real good software that the American Civil Liberties Union uh, created <clears throat> that they do it by states. And they targeted states where a lot of this police killing of unarmed people, uh, they target these states for these apps. I don't know if it's across the country yet. But North Carolina is one of these states. So I have this, down, this app downloaded on my phone. So if 
the time I hit this app, even if somebody comes and the police, if I'm stopped and he's ready to start beating on my head or shoot me or something, from the moment I hit that app, it's recorded, right? And even if someone takes it, it's, you still got visual. It's a lot of, it's an excellent app. And it was created specifically for the issue of police killing of unarmed people. All these roadside beatdowns and shootings and killings and things like that. So all of the IT brothers and sisters that we have in the United States on these campuses and off these campuses, I'm suggesting use that IT brilliance to benefit this Ummah. What does the Ummah need? Where is there a void? And then even in ish areas of social justice, we can create, we got the brilliance, we can create what's needed. Whatever area that you are in, if you are a writer, if you can write, then this is something that use this media that's out there, the social media, whatever, whatever uh, platform you use, if you can produce, you can do whatever, whatever your major is, take advantage of that and put that at the disposal of the Muslims. How can I take this knowledge and this experience that I'm gaining to help the cause of Allah? Because in the end, in the end, that's all that's going to matter anyway. When they lower us into that ground, it is not going to matter about uh, your, uh, you know, how whether you make the Fortune 500 with your company and stuff like that. It's not going. That a law is not going to be questioning us about any of that stuff. But we will be questioned as to how did we respond in this 21st century America when certain things were going on around us that we saw, we heard, we felt, we experienced the pain that we and others were feeling, what did you do? I charge you with this responsibility. Now what did you do? Or did you just go about your own happy-go-lucky way and you know, just acting like it, 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 nothing is going on that needs to be addressed? So what I'm suggesting is not that everybody quit school and just go out and be full-time activists in the community, not, a, not at all. As a matter of fact, when I first embraced this land, I had one reason for being in undergrad school since I was a child, and that was to become a lawyer. That was the only thing, only thing. I was in a junior bar association in my high school. I mean, I just love that stuff. And even today, my wife, it runs her nuts. She goes to another room because I can't wait to Thursday at 3 o'clock if I'm home, which is not too often and Friday at 3 o'clock to have these uh, law and order episodes just back to back to back until about 2 in the morning. So if I'm not really doing something, it's a, it's a guilty pleasure that I love watching these, you know, lawing kinds of shows because that's what I wanted to do. But a law had another, uh, his father for me was different. And so I, I never went on to law school. But Allah grabbed me and said, well, no, I want, this is where you're supposed to be. And it was a part of an Islamic movement in 1972. And, uh, you know, and I'm a part of a different group today, which is a part of the Islamic movement. That has been my heart. That's the, and, and so whatever, uh, you know, whatever I was studying, because right, I had a double major with uh, political science, with the pre-law type stuff, and, and, and English. And so all I have is what I have. I can write a little bit. So I use my writing, inshallah, feasibility law. I'm the editor of the ICNAS magazine, Message International. I know I've been trained as a political scientist. So I can use that, and ICNAS using that with me as being a vice president. In my area, I'm over social justice and civic engagement. So whatever we have, whatever we have, we can put it at the disposal of the work of the law. And the same thing with you. Now, uh, 
there's something like integrative <coughs> psychology or something. What was your graduate school? Uh, I'm doing aerospace. Huh? Aerospace? Who told me they were? Hatham's Hath doing integrative physiology. Who? Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I got, I got you confused. You're doing aerospace. Okay, so there's, there's, there's something there. You've got to figure it out, but there's something there. Right. But, the, uh, but the, everything can be used for good and use it for a good cause and put that at the disposal. But first and foremost, my first advice to any young fledging, I want to get involved, I want to be active, don't get, allow yourself to get disconnected to our source of success and what is going to really uh, make us win in the end. Um, I love, love when, when 45 was elected as president of the United States. I don't call him by his name. I was, he was the 45th president. I don't call him by his name. He's a despicable human being. It's, I can't get president, whatever his name is, out of my mouth. I'll call him. I would love to see part of his prison number. When he goes to prison, he start <laughs> off with 45. And then after that, then maybe I'll call him by his name. But uh, I love seeing young Muslims engaged and involved. And part of my travel, uh, being out these last few days, before I go home, I'm by, uh, taking a short bypass to Chicago. And I'm going to Chicago to meet with members of the ICNAS uh, Young Muslim Group. And I'm meeting with some young people who may not be a part of the Young Muslim Group to try to help get them organized and engaged and, and working on, on certain issues like that. I mean, it's wonderful. But I'll tell you one thing that, that disturbs me or just a little bit, right? Because I understand the frustration and the, the madness of everybody at this point with 45. When this knucklehead was first elected, uh, there were demonstrations everywhere. First time in my life, to know that so many hundreds of thousands of people protested somebody's inauguration. I mean, that was, in my lifetime, that's, that's unheard of. Now, all over the country, hundreds of thousands of people out in the street protesting the dude even being inaugurated. And there were a lot of Muslims in these demonstrations. And, you know, I was pumped up by that. I was glad to see the Muslims, you know, taking a stand like that. But then I started looking at some of the signs of some of the, my young brothers and sisters, some of the signs that they were carrying in these demonstrations, and some of the chants that they were chanting. And it's like, oh no, bro, you know, come on, we, we can't go there. We're Muslim. So we can't have all these obscene signs telling Trump what to do with himself and using all this obscene language. Because otherwise, we're not distinguishing ourselves as Muslims. People should be distinguished as we get engaged and involved in the society. We can't ever lose that identity. And if we don't have it immediately, we have to build on ourselves. We have to build that Islamic identity so that while we're out there, you know, because I, I step off into a lot of different demonstrations. And the funny thing about my journey in this area of social engagement, I started literally in high school. And, uh, and even now, I'm still involved in a lot of things. And about a month ago, I was involved in a demonstration, I spoke at a demonstration in Lafayette Park across the street from the White House. And it was uh, a demonstration about closing Guantanamo Bay. And I reflected while I was standing there waiting to speak, man, I've been doing this since college. As a college student, I used to stand in Lafayette Park. And then that's when I would use all kinds of colorful language against Richard Nixon and all these kind of people, you know, just all kinds of profanity and ready to just say and do anything at that time. But as a Muslim, I have to carry myself in a different kind of way. Not just because I'm older, but because 
this is a distinction that we all should have uh, when we engage and get involved. But I, I want, if anyone's uh, interested in any kind of specific stuff or recommendations, uh, make sure that you have uh, contact information for me if you're interested in this social justice kind of work, civic engagement kind of work. You can get in and, and contact with me you know, directly, and um, uh, and in coordination with our, our local brothers and sisters in this area, uh, you know, we'll be able to come up with you know, some very specific things that we can help out in and even participate. So, questions, comments, anybody else? Can you write down your email? I will. Uh, let me give it to you. Now, if you all can write it down, anybody who might want it, uh, can you write on this? Yeah, you can. Yeah, okay, good. Write, write it for me. Somebody just send it to Get in contact with me, and as I say, in coordination with our local folks in this area, we will we'll do everything we can to, to be involved and be engaged and help in whatever way we can. Is that it? Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Well, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Are you comfortable with taking a picture? Huh? Are you comfortable with the picture? Oh, please, I'd be insulted if I couldn't take a picture of you. <laughs>